Talk Show. It's a daily talk show and we're in Los Angeles. And specifically, we're at EPLP with mm-hmm. Grant Smiley. Welcome aboard, guys. Nice to hear another Aussie accent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we've come to LA and we've managed to find Australians every Aussie. Awesome. Good job, guys. <laughs> uh, I, I saw a mate that has um, Bondi Harvest down in Culver City. Yep. And then we were just at Nick Stone who from Bluestone. I yep. mean, the Australians have adva- invaded. What, what year did you, did you invade America? Yeah, we, we got on the boats and, uh, in 20. <laughs> 14 we arrived here we opened 2015 but I was here 2013 was the first sort of toe in the water so it was what and that's when we signed the lease at this particular spot we have and yep. then it took 18 months of planning and building mm. and whatever else and then you open the doors uh, we had lunch the other day what was the name of that place Chaconis. Uh, uh, we, we were butchering them. the absolute Caccinis, yeah. Cuccinis. <laughs> yeah, it's, you're just being very Australian. We, right can't, we, can't, we can't be influencers because we can't did, pronounce anything. I didn't no. mention it at lunch, but um, growing up, I used to come and watch you at uh, Prince of Wales. Good so, spot. Mate, you, um, you gave me my disco education. and <laughs> Probably robbed you of a few uh, brain cells along the way too. <laughs> mate, it was good fun. Um, so... <laughs> You uh, you used to DJ, obviously, back in the day. How long were you DJing for before you moved into the hospitality game? Yeah, good questions. Uh, I started, well, when I was 16, I looked clearly exactly the same as I did today. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And... I would turn 16 in year 12, so I was turning. I was really young. So then I were you um, like really smart, three? or what? No, nah, the old ladies wanted to get me out of the house <laughs> as quickly as possible. But so what I had to do was go on Wag School, go and meet all the bouncers at this at the Metro in the city at the time, and I went and decided that I was going to be a promoter because it was the only way I was going to be able to get in. And they said you have to write your name on a pass, you know, and that's how you get a dollar per pass. And I said, hey, can I use a drill? And they said, what do you want to use a drill for? I go, because well, otherwise you get to write all the time these initials. I said, get it down there and bang, let's get them all out there. Right? So your mind Mark was the drill the hole. hole. So, okay, yeah, yeah. And so then I was banging them out at universities or whatever else. I was making like two or three hundred bucks a week as a year 12, and they'd give me a hundred buck drink card. I'd turn up going, magic, <laughs> right? So I sort of got into, into that sort of nightclub space, but I was, I was a musician at school as well. So then I post you know, finishing up school, I decided that I wanted to go and pursue that DJ thing. I was doing a marketing management double degree at, at Monash, but at the same time, I was pursuing the, the music stuff. Mm. And became a DJ that went pretty well I was promoting running clubs at the same time mm. and then the, the first pivot was saying I don't want to be a promoter anymore so I want to be judged by the musical mm. you know acumen that I can mm. have because mm. giving yourself a job is a bit you know whatever and you're competing against your peers and all of a sudden oh you run that nightclub oh funnily enough he's just playing there um, but then I started producing and then that was you know the first record we put out was a track called Flaunt It went pretty well um, I used to go to the gym with uh, Sean Sean yeah Shawnee B good old Shawnee yeah yeah, so Knew we, his mum. She came to the gym too. <laughs> lovely <go>. lady. Magnificent. <laughs> um, so we were like, went on to win two areas, sold 300,000 copies. And that was, for that part of it, we couldn't get the record signed. So I started my own record label and that was how that came to be. And yeah. we did our own film clip, self-funded. We got to a point where we said, we've got to go to Warner. You guys can distribute it. See you later, mm. bye. The rest is history. And then uh, did that for the best part of you know 15 20 years uh and then decided the hospitality was well, it was just more than 300 flights a year <laughs> is exhausting oh yeah and, and the late late nights well that what? was all right but you just need to get used to that i think it's like <laughs> habitual but yeah just missing your friend's birthdays going to weddings never went to them you know never saturday night at home ever with your mates ever 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 because that was meant you weren't relevant if yeah. you weren't working on a weekend you weren't you weren't a good mm. jock mm. what makes a good dj uh, Sunglasses. <laughs> yeah. Well, because that's what I'm trying to understand. Because there seems to be like a big, like a filmmaking and videography. There's a huge scope, right? So you have yeah. the, um, the the DJ who has, you know, a thousand CDs and yep. they're rocking up yep. at, a, at the school yep. and they've got the strobe light, he's which is only it. for big, uh, yeah, the, the yeah. big songs. <laughs> Can you? What's the spectrum of DJ? What are the different types of DJs? And how do you end up becoming a producer? Okay, two questions. Mm-hmm. There's two parts of it. Um, how do you become a good DJ? I don't know. The barriers to entry back then were a bit more significant. Mm-hmm. It was 22 bucks for a vinyl single. Mm-hmm. So you had to pick, make sure what you were buying was good because everything was expensive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you had a box, one crate. That was all you could carry. Not mm-hmm. like these days, USB. Mm-hmm. And everyone's a DJ now because it's all, gr- it's all yeah. grid. It's not So you had hard. to curate. You were curating the music. Well, you had X amount of hours and that was all I had. Yeah. So you better make sure it's bloody good content. Mm. And then you assume that everyone's played the biggest record before you got there. Mm-hmm. Because that's what made a good DJ, make your B's your A's and mm-hmm. make sure you can still kill the night without having to play a hit. 
That was my rule. As long as I can, how long can I go without giving them what they want? So what's the secret? What was you, the secret track that you'd pull out if shit was going bad? Uh, what was the one that... Why the fuck bit of, you drop the pressure? There was a bit of that. Yeah. I was going to say yeah. Love Shack, but I'm clearly in a different nah, party. Nah, I used to do this <laughs> mashup with In Excess, New Sensation and Daft Punk. Uh-huh. Um, and it, we used to blow the roof off. But it was two old vinyl things and it was old live drum seat having to correct it all the time on vinyl which is tricky yeah. um, but it's I don't know and then it gets back to your point how do you become a good DJ make the record and the producer mm-hmm. part of it the only way to be an authority in the space is to make it like mm. and be relevant so that was the other reason I stopped DJing I just didn't have time to produce mm. and if I can't actually get in there and drop a record and be like I want to have you in the chart all mm-hmm. the time so on the tools are you using like Ableton or something or what, what do you Logic use Logic Pro yeah. was um, was our weapon of choice but everyone each to their own doesn't mm-hmm. matter whatever you start on you're making good music and I think that's the other problem too there's just this enormous shotgun approach to music these days because Mm -hmm. there's such a proliferation of technology out there so now you're getting I'm going to show I'm showing my age (laughs) god damn it but we used to sit there and play you'd make a record okay to get it out on just, it wasn't even CDs back then you're pressing it on vinyl you have to go on that's co- that costs right yeah. so if I'm going to get it signed that guy's got to say I'm going to spend X on a test mm. pressing then we're going to take it to record shops and they're going to have to want to buy it otherwise there's an enormous amount of money going out of here so I had ears on it I had a guy from the record label who said I believe in it mm-hmm. and he'd be almost playing it down the phone to record stores going what do you think of this record because they want are you going to buy it because yeah. we want to get X amount of buy in to, to actually produce the record so or well, now it's like our export it's on the net it's, you know you can buy it or it's download for free so the, the quality control aspect I feel is not there so samples is that like do, are you like getting beats or stuff from other songs like this sort of you is can. that electronic is that the genre or what is yeah, it yeah I mean sampling's not you know not to electronic I mean mm-hmm. Duff, uh, Kanye's been doing it forever like you mm-hmm. know some of his biggest records have got samples it's just the clearance if you want to sell it and, mm-hmm. and leverage against mm-hmm. other people's works and you, obviously having unique uh, original stuff's your best avenues and not mm-hmm. to worry about clearance but there's no problem you know using other people's works as long as you pay them for their use uh-huh. uh, were you focused on personal brand back then because i think the the smiley brand the grant smiley brand back when i was going to clubs is it was a <laughs> you, you'd nailed it i did right. like just uh, nova a bit of one love mate, you know? it was all there was it is all, is that what you were thinking back then like how can i how can i build my personal brand I'd be lying if I told you I wasn't, but for sure. I mean, look, at the same time, when you're saying what becomes a good DJ, yeah. I spent money back on doing, you know, your logos, your press shots, all the bullshit that goes with that. Because, again, if you either just rip out all the coin, then how do you get better at it, mm. you know? So I just found that also trying to do, like, if you're a DJ, just turn up and do your job. Mm-hmm. It's a bit like the iceberg, you know, during the week, it's everyone goes, oh, you got the best job on the planet, you come out here, you get drink cards, you try and pinch my missus, and, you know, <laughs> see you later, yeah. right? But my whole week was programming, planning, you know, all these edits and things that meant that you come to the watch my show because I've done the work when mm. you get here. Mm. And then it was about the intros and stuff. Make sure when I turn up, I'd be like, I don't know, can you allowed to swear on this thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We cool. swear nice. <laughs> you got to walk into him like fuck you all you're fucking mine <laughs> yeah because I don't know who was performing and I don't really care but look at me look at me and as long as I've got you you look at me and I'm just gonna we're doing this now and you can honestly take them if they'll trust you yeah they start to trust you I'm going bottom of the ocean we're getting away with shit you never should get away with uh-huh. as long as you can sort of demonstrate that I'm putting in more energy than you are mm-hmm. and then I can do some things that give it some relevancy that wants them they're gonna thread that they can follow and then I don't know that's what made it kind of you just got to walk in, it's like, it's just your joint, it has yeah. to be, mm. you know? And I think people want to be led, mm. you know? It, it's If you look like you got any sense of fear and no matter what job it is, mm. I reckon people look at it and go, ah, oh, guys, I got it. Yeah. You know? So, is that, have you taken that on within business? Are you fucking walking into every meeting with a, your fucking mind? <laughs> with a, with a well, you can do that in many different ways. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Um, well, I mean, look, you've got to have some self-confidence in yeah. your brand and what it is you're doing. Uh, and I think that goes a long way. But you've also got to back it up because mm-hmm. it's one thing to sit there and puff your chest out. But yeah. And I think, you know... Humility is, you know, as I've got older, is the more impressive part of your business acumen, you know. I think mm-hmm. it's... I build this, we built this platform to let others be the star of the show, be it mm. the chef, be it whatever else, the designers. I'm first to say who's the... It's not me. What we mm. did was have a curated experience. Mm. Um, and I, if I can't then deliver this and if this is as, as good as it gets, then I guess... 
it's as good as it gets or do I want to progress personally and develop other things and mm-hmm. do other parts of it because the creative foil I guess is what's been my thing that connects the DJing to promoting or this or whatever else it's like the process of the opportunity yeah and you just think oh, what is it that this why was it a roof oh it's a rooftop what are we going to do there oh it's going to put a bar on it okay well it's not rocket science but then it's what are the elements that make it relevant six months six years later mm. you know and it's trying to fast forward mm. that that sort of process and I think that's what I enjoy the most the day to day stuff is kind of you know if Billy doesn't turn up for work I don't really care yeah. as long as someone's doing his shift then that's a manager's <laughs> job it's probably not my job but you know that's you, I think you can spend time in the wrong spots mm-hmm. in your in your day to day lifestyle and it's just trying to push that out as much as you can comedians cutting their teeth opening for bigger acts is um, something you have to go through I think you toured with Swedish House Mafia yeah which you know they're one of the biggest groups in the world and you you were probably the biggest in Melbourne very big in Australia what was that experience like opening for a huge band that a huge group that the people there are there to see Someone else. Swedish House Mafia, <laughs> yeah. not you. So what, yeah. was that a, what was that feeling like? Ah, uh, look, it's good to hang out with the fellas, mate. That wasn't my show, and I think you know what you're going into yeah. with that. So you just, you're, I'm not the star on that mm-hmm. day, that's them. And my job's actually just to be the best warmer up, a fluffer up, whatever you want to call <laughs> yeah. it, you know, yeah. to get them to where the crowd wants to get. And we'd just sit backstage, and I sort of knew what they were playing by that stage, mm-hmm. and I'd just sort of walk through with them saying, here's what I want to do. But every crowd's different. That's the beauty of like mm. music. You go to some place, you think this is going to blow the doors off it and it's like crickets. <laughs> You're like, oh, better go and refocus. But for, for me, it was kind of watching the excitement in a room and you can mm. see it's this palpable energy for waiting for the band to come on, knowing that I'm at 30% volume and they're going to come in at That's what I was wondering. So they, do they actually disengage speakers and shit for the support? <laughs> Mate, I'm running on like pedal power. <laughs> <laughs> but they sort of need to because that's yeah. what makes them magic you know yeah. when it gets all of a sudden it's loud and yeah. it's mm. them and it's the show so you don't get you don't get the co2 you don't yeah. get the fire <laughs> you get none of that stuff right. so these guys come out it's like bang 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 yeah. welcome to the swedish <laughs> house mafia show but look for all those guys don't get me wrong they're doing the same shit we're doing going what's our next single look like mm-hmm. oh, fuck i'm not that creative today um <laughs> better see you tomorrow guys and mm. they keep going back to the well back to the well and how do we remain relevant I'm sure they're doing the same questions that every home studio producer is doing they're just wealthier older and you mm. know and probably got more pressure to deliver so what do you think for, for these huge acts Calvin Harris what do you think it is that has made them pop I mean, look, they're just significant songwriters. I mean, if you think mm. about the Swedes with Don't You Worry Child, they get together with John Martin and they have this record and it still, still tans, stands the test of time. Mm. Calvin writes, he's written records for a generation almost of just mm. banger after banger. That mm. guy's a talent. Oh. And now he's oh, a gardener. Yeah. He's like, got, <laughs> he's bought a big plot of land in Ibiza and he just wants to tend to the garden for a year. Do you burn out? Like, I guess it's, it's a quite a... Uh, extreme lifestyle in some ways bringing that energy yeah I mean you do but I think the other part of it is you also need time out of market (laughs) I think if you give yourself an availability to people all the time and they expect that they can see you and you're going to do another record how do you write the smash hit if you're on the on the road all the time Mm -hmm. and you sit there and I've got to sit down in in front of the computer and be creative for a minute and write this next hit and they're going when's the next hit and you go I just put a record out like two days ago (laughs) you know the internet's (laughs) like well, you guys, every day, what's next? Yeah. Yeah. What's next? You know? Mm. So I think the expectation and, like, you'll see even the Taylor Swifts of the world, they have to go, I need two years off. Ed Sheeran, I want three years off because I've got to write the next album because otherwise, and then I can go on tour it. What was that for you? What was that moment where you realised you had to take a break? Ah, uh, liver damage. Yeah. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, 50, I, just, I just think I got to a point where, I, I remember I was standing at a gig in Albury, sorry, Albury, and... <laughs> I'm like, I've just driven here five hours from Melbourne. Yeah, and the crowd were just not educated about what I was trying to do. And I'm yeah. like, I'm just getting, I feel like I'm a hooker. <laughs> I'm getting paid a lot of money, but I don't really want to be here. Yeah. Um, I, that's it, I'm done. Mm. And I said, I'm running back, went back home, I saw my buddy, I, I got 10 shows left. He goes, what do you mean? I said, I got 10 shows left. Mm. I did 10 shows. I just picked 10 I wanted to do, and that was it. What, what was the you, final one? And what year was that? Ah, oh, shit, that would have been like 2013, something mm. like that. I mean, the, what final show? I think it might have been a My Music Bowl thing or something. But Amazing. I mean, I played the grand final. I played, yeah. you know, I've done like some 
epic shit. Yeah. You know? So What's the grand final? Because the grand final obviously has that stigma. Than life, to be honest. <laughs> well, it, has, it has the stigma of like, you can't fucking win uh, doing the grand final. Did, as an artist... Are you going in with that mindset? I killed it, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, what you open with? The thing about it is, we play, well, the others was big at the time, which is a track we did with the um, Dukes of Windsor. But we did this record, and the benefit of it, on, there's always something that happens on the day. It didn't happen to me. It happened to Jet. So poor old Nick Sester, they had these fallbacks in front of them, and they were weren't allowed to play the drums live um, well they, they were playing them live but they weren't amplified yeah. so it was a click track and whatever else and then they had the, the, the live monitors back through here and the monitors went dead and he could hear himself on this delay about two seconds on the other side <laughs> of the sun stand and he was just like way out <laughs> I'm looking at him going you poor bastard you're dead and the next day was all about how Jet's performance was terrible but it wasn't their fault the amplifiers yeah. went out and if they had to let them play live like they wanted to it would have been no drama but yeah. that's, that's show business hey what was the highlight of all the different performances you did which one stands out oh, so many good ones I mean Ibiza was always great to go and play playing we played a festival in I played the Love Parade in Berlin there's a million mm. people you know it's, they're all so different the bowl in Melbourne when it was on fire for summer days mm. was just closing those things was you know pretty amazing mm-hmm. and there's nothing better than you know when we had a track like a flaunt or whatever else mm. or when there's 20,000 people singing back to you like it's pretty you know mm. amazing I was sitting in Oh, I can't remember. I was with Ivan. We were in maybe Magnetic Island or something, and they said, "Are oh, you going to number one?" And you're like, shit, that's pretty. Imp- that's pretty impressive. Mm. Only because you think we're a bit naive. You know, I was mm. a bit naive. The first one out smashes it. Then you go for your next nom- nomination at the Aria Awards. And you go, well, that's good to even get one. And then you lose it. You're like, oh, it's, these are hard to get, aren't they? It's pretty, you know, <laughs> people have gone their whole lives as career musicians that have never even picked up one of these things. And old mate just waltzes in year one and gets two of them. That's oh, a good tune. It's great tune. But it was just topic. It was just the time. It was timely. It was sounded mm. different. And then after this was sneaky. And then after sneaky, it was the presets. And after the preset, just electronic music had mm. a moment. Mm. I just happened to have a record with the other guys that connected for whatever reason. Mm. And um, you were doing radio with John Course. Sure was. So the two of you. Yep. Was that a? Was that a? Did you guys have a partnership? Were you in business together? Yeah, a bit of both. So, with Nova. You know, contrary to popular belief, they don't tap you on the shoulders and go, hey, you blokes are killing it down at One Love. Do you want to go and do a show? I was at seven and I was running seven and John was at One Love. And I knew that between the two of us, we sort of had the Melbourne kind of club scene happening for the minute yeah. from a musical perspective. So I said, why don't we go to Nova? We'll go and pitch them on a show. We'll just sit there and give them a free show and we'll see if they air it. And so I went and did this demo, put it together and went down. And they said, yeah, we'll, we'll do it. Um, it was, at the time, it was called Overdrive that that was their show name so we said you know we'll do that and then over the next year we said maybe we'll put a fee in it but not a big one it was never about the money it was just Mm. more to cover the production costs and whatever else Um, and so we evolved that evolved that evolved that and then I started saying to the guys at the Prince maybe in the background I was sort of weaving in a bit of maybe I'll just jump ship and we'll join the team together and see what was what and because I was running the seven, I was running all the promo, all the marketing, and I said, and they said, you can just turn up and DJ. I'm like, <laughs> for more money. I'm like, magic. There goes the day job, and yeah, I can just yeah. turn up and play play records. So John and I started playing. It was just them, then the One Love brand. They could. It's a bit like having two full forwards, you mm-hmm. know. They could say, John, you're going to Sydney. Grant, you're going to Adelaide. And it was kind of they could build the brand with all of us. We bought this this suite of dudes that we got all just fill in. But obviously you get to a point where it dilutes the brand so much that you go to Prince on a Saturday night and there's the B team and it kind of didn't, not, mm. no disrespect to anyone there who weren't there at the time. But sometimes it would just, they'd sent this, everyone out, all the A's to all around Australia. Mm. But One Love was really popping at the time. But um, back to your point about John and I. So we, we did a lot of stuff together and I think we, we both benefited from leveraging each other's, you know, kind of, he was, the, he was the Ministry of Sound guy, I was the One Love guy and then we were together it was kind of, that's some of the parts I guess bigger mm. than the whole what did you learn about collaboration oh look I think I've always tried to collaborate with people smarter and better than me I think you've <laughs> always tried you've always got to mm. if they're stupid enough to go and want to hang out with me good, <laughs> good luck to them but um I mean even with you know TV Rock Ivan was a far better producer than I was but I was always like the kind of guy that say that bit's not going to work on the floor let's just axe mm. that do this do that you can spend five hours fashioning that kick because that's what he's he's amazing he's a mm. he's a genius but maybe the, ma- the magic was that i could market it better than other brands and i could get it 
through the cut through the noise and get it into the right hands to make sure it was getting played at the mm. right times. So I think the collaboration thing is here we get I like if I can afford the best chef or the best architect or the best designer and the best real estate and the best whatever just get the mm. best figure it out get a way to get it because the outcome is so much better if they're vested and they're smarter than you because you know you never want to be the smartest one in the room yeah mm. what happens with music and you know years on from that track being released how many years ago was that 20 11 12 11 like years do you still make money from songs because they're still oh, getting played f- on the I'm radio i'm lying mate i reckon <laughs> mate. I, I think last year I, i've got a feeling i might have collected 78 bucks <laughs> And the admin fees These are on me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what happens. It, it just the so you, I, I think about like huge, you know, the I don't know. So Taylor like Swift, Acra and PP, like yeah, these you're people getting, are, you hear about these royalty checks. Yeah, mm. the two billion streams that they're getting pale in significance for our twenty eight thousand last year. I'm sure yeah. whatever it was. I mean, it's all like kind of it's a, it's a touring game. So mm-hmm. these things are just postcards. Send them out. I'd give away if I'm making more music I'd give it away for free because mm. the actual monetary value of what it's a $1.99 on iTunes I've got to do this but I won't take it because mm. if I'm on, on the road then that's where I'm making my, my bread so mm. that's probably the other reason why as much as I'm excited to go back I'd love to go and do another record I'm petrified about what the outcome is yeah going on the road I'm the donut when yeah, did you decide that uh, you were going to live in Los Angeles um, I think I was naive in so far as I thought I could just bounce back and forth between Australia and, and LA and, mm-hmm. and maintain that sort of balance. But pretty quickly, when we got here and open, we sort of just sort of under, the magna, magnitude of what this venue was in particular. We had to staff. We had a hundred staff. You know, within a week of opening, um, you got different labour laws, different liquor laws, different everything, service, mm-hmm. whatever. And I just sort of thought. Yeah, I'm probably going to have to stay. But then at the same time, I mean, you know, you can see in the background that these <laughs> the hills are not too bad. The blue sky's pretty much 360 days a year. Mm. There's worse places to be stranded, yeah. you know. Um, and I still get to go home and I've still got Ponyfish Island in Melbourne and I've still got, I just recently saw my, um, my show in a PR agency there, but I've, I've still got a connection to Melbourne. But mm. I don't think I'll be uh, home in the immediate future. Opening a place like this, I could imagine you you want to know that you can keep the doors open for a certain amount of time, which equates to a, a certain dollar figure because you go, you know, six months running cost. What is sure. the approach when you're opening a venue of this scale? Uh, look, first thing is your assumptions are wrong. That's there, the only yeah. guarantee you yeah, got yeah. because you either be over budget or you're always going to be over budget. Let's yeah, be honest, yeah. you're <laughs> always going to be over budget. But it's kind of like... When, even if you talk about invest, anyone who wants to invest in these things, the only guarantee you've got is that you're wrong in that your budget estimate's going to be either higher or lower. Mm-hmm. You're either going to do better or worse than what you are. But to your point, I guess we th- sort of thought that, I mean, you've got to allow a realistic kind of outcome number. So when you say, do your DD, make sure you've gone through the planning process, understand all the timings and the bill costs, and then allow for your, obviously, everyone's got a contingency. But you, if you can sort of get you've got to get through the first year as any business you've just got to hold your head above water some things catch fire um, and I think for these things metaphorically or we actually did set this place on fire (laughs) oh no shit you're not I mean Mr. Nottis Evans set this place on fire on Saturday night but uh, oh man we had a faulty fire pit down the other end and we had the fireys down here week four and we were literally on fire I sat downstairs at the end of the night with my business partner Dave with three fingers of whiskey going jeez that was nearly the quickest blow up of a couple of million bucks you've ever seen in your life (laughs) but um which is a heartbreak for all restaurateurs because you've done through the work and then it you know it's like a you know a fire in a kitchen is a disaster but back to your point I think look if you can do a strip mall down here real cheap but your food better be just banging Mm. because what's your differentiation so I always like to think about for this it's not easily replicable so Mm -hmm. it does give you some sort of sense of um, protection around what what the site and what you're doing Mm. so I find that Grandmaster records we're doing at Hollywood opens in July or June July this next 2020 and it's going to have a you know enormous rooftop we've spent two years in planning with lawyers and consultants and whatever else but I can tell you no one else has spent two years doing that stuff what's the weird things that you have to consider when you're opening a rooftop 
weight. Yeah. You know, you're putting 500 bodies on the roof. Uh -huh. You know, that's a lot of structure, a lot of steel. Um, then your noise mitigation, what do your neighbors look like? Uh -huh. You know, how you're servicing it, how you're getting vertical transportation up, what's your egress, what's fire, what's this? Oh, mate, you can go. <laughs> It's as long as you want to go. Yeah. And they're all, all the fun police are just spinning sirens everywhere because, you know, our size is go, we'll just we'll be fine. Yeah, she'll, <laughs> she'll be, be sweet, right. She'll be sweet, <laughs> mate. She'll be sweet. <laughs> it's fine until the thing <laughs> buckles and, yeah, and collapses. Yeah. But they're all the things that everyone, because it's such a litigious country, mm -hmm. everyone wants to cover their rear end. So they'll over-engineer the steel. They'll over-engineer mm -hmm. the egresses. They'll over-engineer everything to make sure you're so compliant to the point where, you know, it's, it's crazy, but you just do it. Mm -hmm. um, but... You know, on the upside, there's not many of them, and that's do the work. I guess you get the reward. Having uh, multiple businesses, does it change the type of role once you go from one business to having many? How do you manage that? Yeah, that's a good one. Mm. You just get. I mean, obviously you get busier. Yeah. But you've all, I, what it does is you get bigger. It affords you the opportunity to employ some really good people. So all of a sudden, if someone says, I need a hundred grand to do X, you're like, yeah, it's fine. You know, within reason, as mm -hmm. long as they can justify it, you're the best in your craft. The budget, you can amortize it across a group kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So you've just got to learn to not sweat the small stuff and delegate really aggressively. So plan, like you know that certain things happen each year, New Year's Eve's happening, you know, holiday periods mm -hmm. happen, whatever else. And there's no reason that I can't do the marketing program for Halloween next year. Mm -hmm. It's coming. What's is, the thematic? Is there something around like, so salaries versus taking dividends? Like is, how, how does that work? Do you, do you take a salary from every single business or are you better off making a profitable business that you then take the coin at the end? But, I mean, they both work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's kind of, do you want to exit it and keep all the all the rev and all the profitability in the business, which is a more attractive business to sell? Mm -hmm. um, or and look, we've set up businesses where all profits are retained because that means you can grow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're not sitting there worried about where's the next yeah. deposit coming You've from. You've got it's equity like to be able to yeah, invest. Yeah. It yeah. just keeps getting reinvested mm -hmm. and reinvested. And I think for me, that's a smart play if you can. But I mean, obviously, certain everyone's got different requirements. So some people say I need a dividend because the dividend so you might do a hybrid model where you say you do a dividend of X and the rest gets retained mm -hmm. sometimes someone they want to drain the swamp they want, they'll drain the swamp knock yourself out you yeah. know like they're all different but I think I like to have the available cash because it's otherwise going around and shaking the tin all the time to try mm -hmm. and raise revenue for new projects can be look I think we've we've proven a model so it's a bit easier mm -hmm. but it still takes your time you've mm -hmm. got other stuff to do that's probably more important but your um your second venue from the first is it easier or is it still just the same hard game of hustling no i think it's a bit easier um consultant teams rock and roll you know you just know the right people to call when we got here we had my dave's number my number our eight real estate agent and you got to try and find everything else mm. who's your builder who's this who's that you know what's the liquor supplier and nice aussies come over going ah oh, so i'm going to do a deal with like the equivalent of cub they're going to pay for everything right <laughs> they go hey uh that's illegal i'm like what do you mean it's illegal they go no nah, you gotta just pick whatever you want and you stock it I'm like but what are, who's paying for the beer system yeah like, you are a champ so in australia you're allowed to like you go to uh a new bar in st kilda the village bell sure redone it and you've got they've got all these pipings which yeah. are uh, uh, carlton carlton united so yeah. they they've they've piped in brewery their own fresh. system and they brew it fresh yeah brewery fresh oh, it's, it's dripping because it's so cold <laughs> 500 so, pony fish is coming up soon for renewal it's a good sound <laughs> brewery fresh and so they they chip in they is pay. that the idea yeah so what they'll do is they'll just do an estimate like you can, it's the way that they go about the model um, you can say we looked at your venue we've seen how many taps we reckon you're, gonna do it. you're a good operator we'll give you 250 grand and up front which you can yeah. we pay for you put forward to whatever you choose to but you're going to have to do 600,000 litres mm. and it's either your contract is up when the 600,000 litres is met or five years whatever it might yeah. be so it does allow you in Australia the benefit of that cash flow mm -hmm. but in saying that the tax liquor taxes and whatever else you know it's a 10 bucks for a bottle of vodka in America or it's for the same equivalent one is 40 bucks in Australia so you know it doesn't matter whether I end up getting it on this side where they're paying for it or mm. it's just you know that's the cost of doing business. What was the biggest, like the su the surprise cost that you just weren't expecting? The heaters. <laughs> oh, the heaters are expensive. No, they're not. Um, I, just the hot, the delays, the things you think you're going to open. So you mm -hmm. think you're going to open, uh, you know, December, and, and all of a sudden you're rolling into 
August. Is someone telling you December? Like who who's fucked up? Uh, <laughs> Look, you got to put a. We probably didn't have enough penalty clauses on our builders to yeah. sit there and say that. Yeah, you know, here's the penalties if you don't deliver on time. But then the second part is this: the city sign-offs and mm-hmm. Johnny, who does the gas guide, only works Tuesdays and Thursdays, and he's booked up for the next two weeks. Yeah, sure. and you're like, we're finished. We've finished our job. Like we got, and mm. you've hired all your staff. So mm. we've had, we had chefs. We had six chefs. We pulled out from Australia, sponsored visas. Yeah. And they were on. They, they were painting and like planting shit and like sanding the floors <laughs> with me. We're all just like all pitching. I go, guys, want to get back on the tools anytime soon? Because <laughs> if we don't finish this freaking project, you're all going to be just carpenters with me. Yeah. Um, so, just that co- the cost at the end, the hidden cost of just mm-hmm. the labour costs. Yeah. When we just, we hired way too early, thinking that we we're going to get the mm. sign off from the city, and all of a sudden it's like two months later, you've been paying, you know, forty grand a week of costs, and you know it's two months by, you know, mm. you're not factoring that into your bill costs, and it's just straight out the door, no benefit. But wouldn't do that again. You just yeah. got to wait till you get sign offs, and then just go hard, do uh-huh. some training, and hire at that stage. What came first, Ponyfish Island or, or this this venue? No, Ponyfish is year nine, so it's been going for a while. That was mm. that was a pop up for you know two weeks. Then on the first night, we sold out a beer four times, and I said, "This is permanent." <laughs> <laughs> is a pop up just a, a way of people saying we're testing? Yeah, it's the same way that someone says I'm an entrepreneur and they go, wouldn't you prefer to be called a fucking successful business person? Because yeah. I reckon an entrepreneur is a guy that keeps on fucking failing. <laughs> yeah. so Pop-ups true. are pretty non-committal. It's non-committal. <laughs> are, we, are we dating? Are we yeah, dating? Yeah, yeah. Kind of dating. Kind of. It's, it's, it's complicated. Kind of. yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> but you know, I think for us it was though because it was a piece of freaking concrete in the middle of a river. Yeah. With, you know, you, We still have to bring ice there every day. There's it's no ice bizarre. machine. There's it's no power. such a bizarre spot. It's bizarre. But it's so unique. So so if you if it worked, it was going to be amazing because it's yeah. you're not going to get a piece of land like that yeah. no. anywhere else. But you can't get insurance on there either because it's you know the great flood of '97 and the great flood of 2016. Uh, like it floods every year. Yeah. So and you so got you just factored that in now. Yeah, you just buy fridges with motors on the top so you don't blow everyone up when, they, when the water comes <laughs> up and you know like it's just you got to get everyone out. You know. So, so you'd had a bit of. Um, you know, practice yep. with a venue in Australia, and then you move over here. What's the biggest difference in uh, Australian laws and regulations and American laws and regulations? Like, what blows your mind? Well, it's the, the one thing that I, when we first got here, and, uh, and I still think you, every Australian tourist has, has seen this. When you go to a venue and you say, "Hey, bud, can I um, can I just grab a, a beer, thanks?" And they go, "Yeah, let's go get you a server." And you're like. <laughs> What are you? <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. Goes, oh, I'm the I'm the back waiter. I'm like oh, I just want a beer, <laughs> right? So can you can you just tell the guy who's who's gonna get? Let's just cut out the middleman, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because in Australia, it's like Grant's working your section. Mm-hmm. I'm taking your drink order. I'm clearing your plates. Yeah. I'm dropping your check. Sell out to buy, right? Here it's like no, no, no. I don't collect that. I'm just taking the orders. I'm mm. the I'm the front man. And there's someone else who does that job. Did but you try and just push it the other way? I tried it. Uh, we, we tried it on and the, and all the servers and we couldn't get staff. They're like, I'm not doing that. I'm, and I said, explain it. I'm like, you get the tips for that guy. You uh-huh. can pull them. You get a lot of it. Sure. It was like, you, you've asked them to go and jump off the side of a building. I think I've mm. created a bunch of drama in the US before where <laughs> I have managed to get someone to do something. <laughs> or it's the shift that took, like even... Uh, uh, yes, and they have to split checks at the end yeah. of the tips, and you've you've caused that drama. I know. drama. Well, we even not to brag, but we went to IHOP last night. Oh. <laughs> and, um, you've really, you really gone for it. Yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, no, the lady actually, the uh, the waitress said, "Oh, can I can I just close your uh, close your checkout? Check out because I'm finishing my shift. Yeah, yeah, it's weird too." Yeah. How about you just leave it open, love? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is strange. It's odd. I'm just going to, oh, they'll come and say, make sure that I'm, I'm leaving. So I'm just letting you know that I'm leaving. Yeah. Yeah. And they're going to be taking you up. It's like... It's so much drama. How does it, what, what does it do to um, the culture of, you know, your venue and the staff? Look, it's all about how you deal with it. I think at the same time, like, you can have a model in America where it's kind of, everything's a piece of real estate. So you can rent this for 2000 on a Saturday mm-hmm. and that seats that and that seats that. And mm-hmm. it's quite a common sort of thematic even at sports bars booths it's like 400 buck minimum spend mm. it's a real estate game it's real estate yeah. Game. Yeah, it really is and, and but we found that then you can't really regulate the kind of crowd or if you do and you're a bunch of 15 blokes I'll just buy two tables but then you got 15 knuckleheads all hanging around it's just like really yeah. and it's yeah. not the best look uh-huh. so we sort of decided we'll create a rooftop pub kind of scenario where mm. it's just it's elevated and it's, it's beautiful but I'm not going to try and worry about this bottle service sort of kind of thing mm. I want you to come often and enjoy it and it's not pretentious it's just 
kind of part of the community. And I think that's what's made it give it some longevity because there's always the hot new thing that rocks through the, the venue. So there's like down the street when the nice guy was, was banging, it was just bottles. And then they open up another venue up the road called Poppy. And then that hot crowd goes there and then they're sort of singing for their supper down the road. Because so it's, bottles, that just, um, I haven't been to that many venues. Bottle surf. So you had a bottle of tequila, a bottle yeah. of... So you have to go, is that common in Australia as well? Do no, people they're do starting that? it now. They're starting. Hopefully is it a bit try hard? Oh, because it's, it's, it's like a little like bit in like... Australia. It's yeah. like I, when I came 2012. Small, small dick syndrome. Yeah. 2012, got I got into the bottle button. service here. I saw a promoter say, because uh, a lot of the promoters, they'll get a huge cut they do. if they sell a bottle. The bottle's yeah. 800 bucks. Yeah. This one guy says, I didn't sell bottles, I sell expensive ice. <laughs> that you can put a free bottle into. Wow. The bottles are free. The ice is expensive. Wow. <laughs> wow. But so then, so like I remember Bootsy Bellows. Is yeah. that still open? Yeah, they just spent a couple of million bucks on it. They're, so they've redone it. Redone it. That's the hard part. Through with those things, you're always flipping the concept, flipping it, flipping it, making it new again, making it new well, again. Was that because they? I mean, I remember that being an exclusive club. Yeah, it still is. It still is. Yeah. And so, is this a a play in the opposite direction of exclusive, or is it still? an exclusive venue but no, with a different approach it's just like I mean look we still regulate but it's kind of you, do, you can regulate your crowd in many ways like you can be a lot more subtle they just sit there and go it's a real estate game mm. you put an extra two bucks on your cocktails and put the West Hollywood rooftop tax on it yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if someone's looking for a true value I want to go to a sports bar because I only want to pay five bucks for a beer well then this isn't your spot yeah. mm. and that's okay because they're going to find somewhere else and there's probably going to be more to their liking anyway so I think you can curate it by design pricing and other elements mm. that it still makes you land the right people where you want to get them so that's that's where I think the long play is yeah there's I I find nothing sadder than walking past a venue that has zero people in it all the time. Mm. Like I start thinking, oh fuck, this is going to be closed soon, and I keep looking. I mean, is that a is that feeling something you have with a venue where you're like, fuck, if I don't start seeing people here soon? Like, I mean, this one's pretty busy. Well, it's like burger places in Melbourne, right? There was like <laughs> five you. five years ago. Yeah. Everyone was opening fucking burger yeah. places. But is it I, on your mind when you're opening a venue going, it's is this just a trend? Come? Is this going to, yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I think you've got to build beyond the trend. That's mm, why okay. I think with hospitality, it's a, I, you think of it as like a, a layered cake mm -hmm. that's got design, food, you know, beverage, uh, events, you know, whatever it might be that have so many different elements. And any single one of them might collapse for a minute, but the thing doesn't fall apart. Mm -hmm. You can rebuild it, fix mm -hmm. it, get it right. And if you're saying you go so balls deep into a concept and you say it's this burger thing that's going to be, we're doing like, you know, a plant based burger. Uh -huh. Interesting story. Crafe Gratitude has a um, all vegan, all plant based everything, right? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, these other restaurants around town start adding vegetarian, vegan items to their menus because it's become like relevant, important to do so. Do you reckon that when they were the only one, you went balls deep, mm. we're vegan, and then everyone used to go there. Now you're out and you're out with your friends and they don't want to go to the vegan or vegan spot. But you can still eat like a vegan at our venue at down the road. Mm. So where are you going? Do you reckon they're as busy as they were at the start? No, no way. So a niche is overrated then? depends if you're the best sushi joint in town you're the best sushi joint in town mm. full stop yeah so i kind of think that it's still okay to be niched it's just you got to be balls deep if you're going to do it yeah yeah but even then there's no guarantees i don't know there's nothing certain there's only like 15 institutional restaurants in melbourne there's mm. probably only 20 here yeah mm. they can survive 20 25 years I mean, I don't know. Do you want to stand around the same joint for 25 years? Some just feel good. Yeah. And you just don't know what that magic is. What do you think the magic is uh, for here, EPLP? I think over time, it just keeps on changing. Like the greenery on the roof just continues to grow. So every year it looks a little bit different. Um, we put a big tent on it, like over the fall, over mm -hmm. the winter, because the first two years it was just freezing up here. And we doing movies? Say freezing, as, are you doing movies as well? Doing movies. We added a movie theatre. Um, Is up it here. a clusterfuck with licensing? Uh, you get through it. It's pretty funny when we opened it and we we started doing the, the movies, and it's like, what are we going to pick? Yeah. And like all of a sudden, it's the. Uh, Look to the Oracle, which is yeah. called uh, Google. Yeah. What's the, you know, <laughs> one of the most popular chick flicks? And then yeah. you sit down and you're throwing darts at the dartboard. Yeah. And we just program the shout out at Five Nights a Week. And Ten just, Things I Had About You. Yeah, that smashes there. it. Yeah, yeah. Kills yeah. It. That's a good one. Um, and yeah, Crocodile Dundee didn't so much. Not oh, really? No, nah, it didn't work. Could have gone either way. Dave and I loved it. Yeah. That was for yeah, that's for you. It was good. It was good fun. But you just got to figure out which one didn't work. And mm -hmm. we found out pretty quickly we had a 70% skew towards women mm -hmm. at the cinema. And it was like a date night. Oh, well, chick! They, the date they bring the dates, they bring the guy, or yeah. was it, or was a girls' night out? Yeah. So then all of a sudden it was 
those kind of yeah, movies. Yeah. And, you know, the notebook sells out, you know, la la land, you can shot 17 times in a season, you know. <laughs> So, but we just once you know what the what it's doing, you just then skew it more the next mm. year and get it tighter, do it better. Um, and it's for us, it's like on a Tuesday night when you've got 110 sold out th- uh, movie and 60 of them are doing dinner at six o'clock downstairs in your restaurant. When you walk in at six, where everyone else is waiting for their first client to come in, we've got a pumping mm. restaurant, and it just builds momentum and energy. I think, mm. like you said, when you don't like you don't want to see a place that's empty. Mm-hmm. If you can walk into a room and it already feels like it's rolling. It's much more enjoyable. Yeah. Does the sheer amount of people in this city mean that venues have more people going to them? Like, so they they are less empty, but it doesn't mean they're necessarily doing really well. Not. I mean, uh, you'd think so, but not really. Yeah. I mean, there's a handful of people. West Hollywood's kind of, you know, the 50-yard line of where everything's happening. So you got halfway between downtown, halfway to Santa Monica. It's kind of the center of the universe over mm-hmm. here. And it's also the rent you pay for it. Mm. But, you know, Catch is busy, Chicone is busy, we're busy. But along that same strip, you know, if you get your concept wrong when you're paying those rents, it's mm. kind of, you're in and out pretty pretty quickly. But, and people are still, it's a city of villages. They're so habitual. Like if to get me to go to Studio City across the hill, it's like, <laughs> yeah, maybe. Mm. You know, go to Malibu, yeah, Nobu, twice a year. You know, so I just think you've got to be a neighborhood restaurant first and foremost, mm. irrespective of where you are on the planet. But don't get me wrong, on a Saturday night here, we can get a thousand people trying to come through the doors because there's a lack of, there's either a nightclub and there's either a dedicated bar, or there's none of this kind of thing where you can just mingle a loungy kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I don't want to, as soon as you go to a nightclub, night's over. You can't, what? You know, you're not, yeah, it's yeah. a different kind of thing. So getting that blend, I think, is the is the hard part and getting something where you have a restaurant that you can come for a meal, stay for the night, is kind of what we're trying to do as our sweet spot. You, Differentiate it. You'd be in the know of the real estate around here. Like I, I, I know Ackland Street in St Kilda in Melbourne, there's someone that owns pretty much half the street yeah, and then yeah. Balaclava and out to Collingwood. Is it, is it a similar vibe here? There's a bunch of people that own a lot of the buildings? Yeah, there's two families down here that own about one and a half billion dollars each of real Holy estate down shit. the strip. And they just, you know, once you're in with them, they're nice people. Yeah, yeah. But Melrose Place, they just sit there and they've been, they've been planning that, saying we're going to hold out, Balenciaga come in. You know, you mm. know, people will be applying, nah, nah, mm. Chanel, great. Because they want to replicate like Rodeo Drive kind of oh, real yeah, estate yeah. prices. Mm. And by doing that, it, but they'll just let it sit for two years because they're like, oh, I don't need the money. Mm. But yeah, they're, it's very wealthy people, small pool of supply and they're just regulating it and so, so how do you what's the what's the approach to get in with these people as a foreigner look you can anyone can get it you just gotta pay enough idiot tax <laughs> you know but it doesn't mean it's going to guarantee that you're going to be successful they'll take your money don't get yeah. me wrong but it's it's sometimes just unpalatable the rents and being in Melrose does it how much is it important to be in Melrose can it stand two streets back and still attract if mm. is your concept going to stand up whereas does you know you're, you're competing with Adidas or as they say out here Adidas, Adidas. you know to try and they're going to say well we, we don't we need a retail presence or the real real which is across the road from us which you won't know back in Australia but the real real is a consignment store where you've bought your Chanel jacket and you wore it twice and I want to sell it so you give it to them they take 30% of the rev, you get 70% of the rev. So they're doing a billion dollars worth of sales a year oh, wow. on secondhand clothing. But they, they authenticate and make sure it's legit. But then they hold no stock. They just, I mean, as far as, I'm not producing shit. You send me your stuff, mm. I sell it, I take 30% of the clip, and it's 99% online. But they did one store in Melrose, they do one store in LA, in New York, and that justifies. So two, I'll pay stores. two stores. Two stores. What the fuck is this, by the way? Is this oh, a is yeah. this a this, we saw this Trump. before? That's Trump, <laughs> is it? Yeah, it's it's the uh, that's a Osprey uh, helicopter. It looks like we're in some futuristic movie where so, the world's so coming what, to an what end. is that actually for? Like, what do they uh, use that for? That'll be some. That's an it's army like a it's, fucking drone or something. Yeah, shit. it's an army thing. That's that generally goes with the uh, whenever the presidential detail comes into town. Yeah. We saw it the other day, and it looked quite alien-like. Yeah, yeah, that's that's my Uber chopper. <laughs> <laughs> so with with talking about uh, that example, which is sort of, I guess they don't have that many overhead outside of the venue or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Something like this, there are heaps of overheads. Where are the margins? Where do you actually make money in a venue like this? Look, we've we've got the benefit of having you know an enormous amount of. Um, venue events mm-hmm. ticket sales from this you know weekend liquor sales 
food sales in the restaurant. I mean, we're just a busy spot. Mm-hmm. So it's the overall sum of the parts. But I think where we have wins is labour costs compared to Australia yeah. and liquor costs compared to Australia is where you're getting that extra couple of marginal points that yeah. allow you to do it. Um, don't get me wrong, the rents are just as expensive as Australia, if not more. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know... Melbourne, when we're talking about this week, it's been a tremendous cup week, I'm sure. Everyone's looked tr- uh, unbelievable. But it's rained on Saturday, I understand. It rained mm. on Oaks Day. And it's raining on Stakes Day. And everyone's predicting to do enormous revenue mm. at the Arbury Bar. Good on you, Richie. Um, <laughs> but if it rains in Melbourne a lot. Whereas yeah. We haven't had rain here since May. So How's everything green, by the way? Oh, because they ship it down from San Francisco yeah. and <laughs> the water. <laughs> yeah, and they've still got the like you know the the Aussie broom where they'll sit out the front with their hose like they'll know it's down in Rosebud yeah. oh, man. and just spray the sidewalk. I'm like, is it a drought drought here? Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. And you go, ever heard of some elbow grease guys? Yeah. No, no, it's out the front, and no one says anything. It's frightening. Yeah, it's crazy. Frightening. Um, we, with the US um, currency when it when it's going good against the Australian dollar. Yeah. Do you invest in different ways? Do you say, hey, the US is doing really well, I'm going to start doing more in Australia, or does it not really come into consideration? Not really. I mean, at the moment, it's sort of, for us, our, our next you know, two years is here. Mm-hmm. Um, and it would be a distraction for me to go and look at anything back home. Yeah. Um, don't get me wrong, if it gets to the, if the Aussie peso really falls away <laughs> and it gets to like in, in 50 cents or something, I'll go and buy a house back home because it's double, you know, yeah. double your money. Uh-huh. Um, that's attractive. But other than that, not really. I think it's kind of... We're earning US dollars here, and I guess you know we get the benefit of when I go home and sell out of the family. That's mm-hmm. nice. Yeah. But it's and, and on the inverse, the tourism is is a bit more challenged when the dollars, you know, up against it because you know people mm. sit there going that drink's freaking expensive and that hotel's not two hundred bucks, it's three hundred bucks. So, but you know, as they're always when you're on holiday, you've got to think about it in the currency you're in. Otherwise, you have the worst time oh, of your yeah. life. Mm-hmm. Well, because then it, it actually is the same, but just. When you put the conversion on it, it kills you. Yeah, it just it ruins your holiday. He's got to go, don't worry about it, leave it as it is. Yeah. So for um, Aussies coming to LA, yep. what are three things that they can do? One thing in the morning, one thing uh, in the Arvo, and one thing at night that's different to what everyone else is doing to have a great experience? Well, look, there's a thousand things you can do here. I guess it depends where you're staying because mm-hmm. um, that's a little bit of a driver. But, yeah, sure. I mean, you've got to do a hike. It's mm-hmm. one of those things. It's mm-hmm. a quintessential Californian thing to do. And if you're on this side, of course, it's Runyon. You'll see more rip bodies in the morning than you've mm-hmm. ever seen in your life. It's like it's tops off at 6.30, <laughs> ready to go. Oh, yeah. It's <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> and if you're, down, if you're down sort of Malibu way, you can go to Temascal Canyon, mm-hmm. any of those ones. But look, there's a thousand online things for hikes. They're mm-hmm. all, it's all fun. What's, and your, what's your hike of choice? I actually life? live right near Runyon, so it's kind of pretty easy. You just yeah. go and bang it out. But I do it at sort of five in the morning when it's dark. Really? Yeah. yeah. Still top off. Oh, tops <laughs> off, mate. Always. Um, and then I guess from like the afternoon and evening things, I mean, afternoon in California can be, in Australia, we've always thought that you can never go to a pool, right? Mm. A hotel pool. Yeah. All the hotel pools are free. Yeah. Just go and sit by one. So even mm. if you're not staying at the addition, just go rock up and use their pool. Go oh, stay. here in LA? You can really? Get, can you go to the Mondrian? And- yes, mate. Well, Tully Jeez. keeps saying, you can only go while I'm here, oh, guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's because she obviously doesn't want you to buy the pool with her. <laughs> <laughs> but you can. You just, just go and rock up to the Roosevelt. They're happy to take your money. Go yeah. sit by the pool. Oh, knock it out. So yeah. if you don't have a pool at your place or your Airbnb, go down to the Roosies, tell them I sent you, <laughs> and you're good to go. But seriously, it's a great tip, and you can use the uh, hotel. Mm. Hotel pools, no problem. Oh, that's a great idea. Um, and then by night, look, I think one thing they do really well here is the, there's the dodgy sports bars. If you want to go to Barney's or one of those kind of ones and just mm. get, you know, and 15,000 beers on tap and more sports than you know what to do with. Mm. Like we think we've got sports here that you've got all year round. There's NBA, there's, there's bar, you know, there's, that's being college and then professional, then it's mm. hockey, then it's, you know, it's just every night something's going on. And if you can get to if you can get to a Lakers game or a Clippers game at the Staples, it's unbelievable. Is there any any tips on getting tickets? Are they always just going to be fucking expensive. Or? They are expensive, but always yeah. go to StubHub. Uh-huh. Um, StubHub is if you get them last last minute, if you're prepared to hold your breath and mm-hmm. you see what's what, waits for half an hour an hour before tip off. Uh-huh. They're either going to be empty mm-hmm. or you can get a deal. And if it's just an online scan code, so you can get it five minutes before tip off, be down on site, know you're going in, and just wait for the last minute deal. Oh, awesome. So. Uh, w- uh, America is known for you know thinking big. It's the land of opportunity. You back when you're DJing, you're at Prince, you're in Albury. Were you thinking big? Were you thinking this is on the cards 
for you? I didn't think California was on the cards. Um, but I mean, always, I always had m- multiple businesses. I, you mm. know, I sold my DJ agency to Ministry of Sound. I sold my record label back to my partners because I just sort of didn't have any passion for it anymore. But I was always going to create new things. So I, I'm. I don't know if this is my forever career. I think po- probably the next step's going to be hotels or something like that. I mm. don't know. But um, I don't think we're actually tied to anything anymore. Mm-hmm. I think you're only as limited as your own dream. But you've also got to have the stones to back it up. Yeah. Um, my only thing is I'd suggest, you know, you don't want to risk every single dollar you've got in your pocket to fulfill a dream. Um, it's pretty boring to be, you know, especially the older you get, like, I, I don't have children, but if you had to, if you're risking your livelihood of your family or, you, or, your, or your children, you just can't do that anymore. But mm. risk as much as you can afford to lose and just push it in. EPLP. Is that a records reference? Like what's yep. The, yeah. yep. So extended play and long play. So the old, you know, seven inches and and twelve inches. They were the uh-huh. old extended play, long play. Um, luckily enough, with the, the next cafe is called Strings of Life. Uh-huh. Um, and then Grandmaster Recorders. When we found the site and it was, you know, an old recording studio, I walked in. I went, oh fuck. <laughs> That's what we're doing it, <laughs> you know. So it's and the musical undertones. Just one that we've just decided is a thematic to travel through. Mm-hmm. It doesn't necessarily play a significant part. We have DJs here, but it's not. You know, we're certainly. It's just more of a reference to what was the past and what is now my future. Yeah, it's an amazing spot. It's mm. like we can see behind us. What hills are it? What, what are they? So they're the Hollywood Hills. Hollywood Hills. <laughs> yeah, Hollywood Hills behind us. So yeah, behind great. us, it's a Sunset Strip, just straight up back this way. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, it's and at night time, you know, it's a pretty pretty special spot to look up on you know mm. there's, there's not too many spots in the world like this mm. um, and funnily enough you're just going to find that magic one street up is too close to the hill you don't get the same sense and then one street back it's too far away so it's perfect you know it's it's that lucky well I wasn't lucky I think my business partner Dave was in real estate so he, he did the, he did a great deal finding yeah, yeah. it so and you've made enough impact that no other one's going to come here anytime soon <laughs> no I, I think we're good I think we're good Grant thanks so much for coming on the Daily Talk Show it's we've really appreciated all the time you've given us it's been no awesome it's great to see you it's the Daily Talk Show hi at thedailytalkshow.com is your email address if you want to send us an email otherwise see you tomorrow guys see you guys